Good evening, everyone. Thanks for uh, uh, joining us here in the Memorial Church, the Appleton Chapel, the Memorial Church tonight for the second of our Noble Lectures this academic year. William Belden Noble was an 1885 graduate of Harvard College and began studying ministry out of admiration for Harvard's own Phillips Brooks, who was, as I said, a beloved pre uh, preacher at this college and Bishop of Massachusetts. But uh, Noble was forced to disenroll from seminary shortly after starting his studies due to illness. He was in poor health for about a decade before dying of heart failure at age 35, after which his widow, Nanny Yuli Noble, established this series of lectures in her late husband's honor and memory, hoping to promote by their legacy the work that he was unable to devote his life to, that is, to the service and the ministry and the upbuilding of humankind. The scope of the lectures, the original bequest reads, should be, quote, as wide as the highest interests of humanity. In the past 125 years, we have hosted professors, ministers, monks, artists, filmmakers, novelists, a president, and two senators as our noble lecturer. This year, we are taking climate crisis as our theme in a series of four lectures. Last month, as some of you know, John Green came and spoke to us beautifully about the end of the world in a talk that I commend to you. If you didn't hear it in person, it's available on our YouTube page. You should check it out. In March, Dekala Chungyalpa of the University of Wisconsin will be with us. She is a Tibetan Buddhist and climate activist who is engaged in organizing indigenous communities around uh, climate activism. In April, the Ugandan theologian Emmanuel Katongole will offer a lecture that explores the relationship between post-conflict reconciliation and environmental sustainability. So if you care about these issues, I invite you please to pay attention to future announcements and to return for those lectures. Tonight, however, we are honored to welcome Norman Wurzba, who is the Gilbert T. Rowe Distinguished Professor of Christian Theology at Duke University and Senior Fellow at the Keenan Institute for Ethics, also at Duke. Raised on a farm in Canada, Professor Wurzba has built a distinguished academic career informed by his family history with farming, having produced several highly regarded books that explore the intersections of philosophy, theology, ecology, and agrarian studies. They are also works deeply and often beautifully infused by his experience of working the land, by the honesty of human labor and the holiness of the created world. Tonight, Professor Wurzba will speak to us about hope in the Anthropocene, about hope in this age of escalating ecological crisis. Climate change and all its attendant catastrophes is a challenge that I suspect will demand the utmost of honesty and holiness in us all. And since his works speak so clearly and so resoundingly of these things, we are fortunate to welcome Professor Wurzba to our church and to this chapel this evening as our noble lecturer. Please join me in showing him our gratitude. So first, thank you for those very kind words, Matt. It's a real honor and pleasure to be here. What I'm going to talk to you about tonight is part of a, a book project on hope that I've been working on with a number of fellow scholars over the last few years where we were trying to think about how do we rethink academic disciplines in light of Anthropocene realities. And it's been one of the most invigorating conversations I've had to listen to people who come from so many different points of view talk about these very big, big questions. And uh, so in this paper, I try to reflect what I've learned from many of them, which has been a lot. When I talk to people about climate change, along with several other ecological calamities, are you ready for the list? Soil degradation and erosion, species extinction, confinement, animal feeding operations, fresh water contamination and depletion, bleached coral reefs, deforestation, mining extraction, sacrifice zones, decertification, mountaintop removal mining. I now know that I risk inducing the symptoms of what some mental health professionals are calling pre-traumatic distress syndrome. You might be feeling it right now. And that is before I even start to list many of the social political calamities that regularly make their way 
into our daily news feeds. This form of pre-traumatic stress disorder happens when people feel that they're being bombarded like so many concussive blows by an unrelenting stream of bad news. They recognize that multiple natural disasters are here and more are on the way, but they also feel powerless to extricate themselves from the impending doom. It is too much to bear, so they often retreat, detach emotionally, and look for ways to shield themselves from yet one more eco-social catastrophe. They don't often want a detailed exposition of what is going on. They want instead to get straight to the heart of the matter. Are there grounds for hope in a world that is being steadily degraded and becoming increasingly uninhabitable? Young people routinely ask me if they should still plan on having children. Some ask if I have any tips for surviving the eco-apocalypse. And so I ask, how should we think about the grounds for hope in a time when so many people are feeling stress, anxiety, anger, depression, mourning, and grief in the face of so much damage and loss? How should we be preparing each other for a future that portends widespread creaturely suffering, social unrest, and political and economic instability, especially when knowing that much of the pain and conflict has been caused by people like me aiming to live a successful life? As I have thought about hope, I have had to learn that it is important not to assume that people want it. Admonitions to be hopeful, besides being disingenuous, can also be distracting and anesthetizing, especially when spoken by people enjoying comfort and power. Because like a soporific, these admonitions lull people into an acceptance of the status quo. Suitably pacified, the task of hoping is reduced for waiting for the miracle that will in some hypothetical, perpetually deferred future make everything all right. This is why the indigenous philosopher Kyle White instructs us to be cautious around the purveyors of hope. Their calls to hopefulness can generate what he calls the ultimate bystander effect that excuses people from the hard work of correcting the injustices that create hopelessness in the first place. Think, for instance, of the generations of religious leaders that have told their followers to accept their suffering and endure every hardship because God will, in the end, make everything right. Pains will eventually be healed and injustices corrected, provided that people are patient and put their hope in God. Think, too, of the business tycoons and technology gurus who tell their followers that there will always be a technological fix that will get people at least those who can afford it, out of whatever troubles they find themselves in. Technicians and engineers can be trusted to create the technologies that are getting steadily, if not inexorably, better. My point is not to deny God or trash all technology. It is instead to indicate that people have not been well served by these expressions of faith that often pacify people and render them spectators of their own lives. You see, assurances of hope can be seductive. I regularly sense their power when I am in conversation with people with some of the most weighty and challenging issues of our time. As our conversation comes to a close, I now know that someone will ask, what gives you hope? A compelling answer, presumably, will help us all feel better, or perhaps feel a little less paralyzed by the sorrow and despair we might otherwise feel. But what if this is not the right question to be asking? The framing, what gives you hope, can make hope seem like a thing we can pick up along life's way. Some people have it, some people don't. The key is to find it, 
hold on to it tightly, and ideally pass it along to those who are without it. The temptation, then, is to think that hope works like a shield, or less combatively, a security blanket that protects people from the many troubles of this world. I understand the temptation. I, too, want assurances that everything, somehow, at some time, no matter what, is going to be all right. My concern with this framing, however, is that it casts hope as something that people simply acquire, like a vaccine that renders people immune to this world's troubles. What if hope isn't really, or at least not fundamentally, a thing to possess? What if hope is instead a self-involving way of being that is animated by an affirmation of the goodness of this life, or a practiced way of life rooted in the conviction that this life is beautiful and worth cherishing, defending, and celebrating? I recognize that this is an uncommon way of speaking, which is why I now try to shift the question from what gives you hope to what do you love? I make the shift to love because conversation and reading have taught me that people who live in hope do not seek to shield themselves from the pains and problems of this life. Instead, they engage the trouble and thereby demonstrate that hope grows and its meaning is more fully discovered in the action of working for a better world. The most important matter is not that people have a fully worked out picture of what a better world looks like, or that they have a clear sense of the exact form their action should take. It is, with humility, to act on the conviction that your world needs you and is calling you to contribute in some way. It is to believe that this life and this world are sacred and thus worthy of your protecting and cherishing. To ask people what they love also has the merit of opening a space for two further important questions that bear directly on a hopeful life. What inspires or activates your love? And what are the practical conditions that optimize a loving way of being. Apart from having someone to love and places and things to cherish, and apart from feeling the love of others, it is hard to see how hope has a future at all. As I understand it, hope does not depend on having figured out what the future will be. This doesn't mean that the future doesn't matter, or that we should dismiss scientific forecasts about matters such as sea level rise, the displacement of millions of creatures, cataclysmic weather, weather events. Hope's focus instead is in on, on inspiring the commitment and developing the practices that position people to live now in ways that nurture and heal life. We do not owe people of the future an accurate prediction of what their life will be. What we owe them is a commitment to do now the good work that will lessen the prospect of a future nightmare. Doing good work, we also cultivate the conditions in which a decent and hopeful life can grow. Wendell Berry says, hope lives in the means, not the ends. His point is important to emphasize for two reasons. First, we don't know enough to comprehend all that is happening in the present let alone the future, which is why we should not put too much confidence in making predictions about outcomes. And second, undue focus on outcomes can distract us from discerning and doing the good we need to do in response to current damage and loss. The cardinal mistake of both pessimists and optimists is that they assume too much certainty. Hope moves within the spaces of uncertainty, just like love, and searches for the goodness that is to believe to be reality's heart, just like love. To hope is to trust that it is worthwhile to seek and nurture the good, despite the damage and ruination we see. 
To hope is to assume that change for the better is rarely straightforward and quick, but often slow and unexpected. Hopeful people do not expect to solve it all. Their aim is more modest because they understand that this world and its life are more complex and mysterious than anyone can comprehend. At the most fundamental level, what moves them is love for this life. To appreciate what I mean by these introductory remarks, I want to tell you a true story and then reflect on it with you. It is a story about displacement and abandonment, but also a story about what binds us together. The binding together is important because I believe, along with the sage Kohelet, believed to have written the book of Ecclesiastes, that whoever is joined with all the living has hope. So now the story. It was supposed to be a little holiday, the last voting excursion of the season for Carmine and Rosaria Mena to join with six of their closest friends to enjoy the pleasures of the sea. Their plan wasn't to go far, but to remain in sight of the coast of Lampedusa, their small island home in the Mediterranean located between Italy and Tunisia. A luxurious evening swim in a cove, along with the gentle rocking of the boat, had provided a good night's rest. The dawn promised a sunny and peaceful day in which to cruise about and fish. But when Carmine emerged on deck, his peace was interrupted by the squawking sound of what he thought to be a flock of seagulls. When his friends joined him on deck, they said, something is screaming. It wasn't seagulls they heard. It was people, hundreds of them, thrashing in the water, yelling with all their might, desperate for help. As Carmine steered his boat to the site, they encountered the floating debris of a sunken vessel, along with discarded clothes and shoes. They saw the dead. They saw faces gasping and choking, many of them clearly exhausted. How long had they been in the water? The sea writhed from so many people kicking and flailing to stay afloat. How long before they lost the energy to keep trying? Carmine thought to himself, they are all drowning. I can't possibly save them all. His boat, the Galata, was built for a maximum of 10 people. Neither Carmine or his friends had any training in ocean rescue. They also knew that there are strict laws against aiding illegal immigrants. Working together as a group, Carmine and his friends eventually managed to pull 46 men and one woman on board. They later learned that many of the migrant women and children had been trapped below deck and drowned when their boat went down. There were so many hands begging to be grasped. Agonizing choices had to be made. They decided to focus their efforts on clusters of people rather than individuals knowing that their decision to rescue some consigned others to death. There wasn't much time. Those still alive had swallowed a lot of seawater and were visibly sick and exhausted. Their bodies were covered with a film of diesel fuel, making them slippery to hold on to. As more migrants were pulled on board, they risked capsizing the Galata. Like many others living in the Mediterranean region, Carmine knew that thousands of migrants tried to reach European shores every week. He also knew that many of them died in the attempt. It is not for nothing that the Mediterranean is known to be the world's deadliest border, claiming over 30,000 migrant lives since the year 2000, with many more victims unaccounted for. When Carmine heard news about these migrant crises, how they were moving across the Mediterranean, he often turned the radio off. He wanted to live his own life, take care of his family, and keep his focus on his optometry business. 
Carmine didn't speak badly of the migrants that came upon Lampedusa's shores, or, like some others, complained publicly about how their presence was destroying local tourism. But he didn't visit them at the town reception center either. He was shy and reserved, not known as the person who hugged freely. This is why Carmine was so surprised by the visceral attachment he suddenly felt pulling the first young man aboard. He wanted to hug and comfort him like a protective parent. To this day, he has not forgotten the feel of the young man's hand in his, nor the power that flowed through his body as he reached out to grab hold of yet another person, wanting and willing each of them to survive. He says he never felt more alive in his life than at that very moment. His muscles tingled and his nerves sparked with energy. When the Coast Guard finally came, he could not fathom the captain's order to stop their rescue effort. Nothing in him wanted to steer the Galata back to shore. Months later, Carmine said, I can still feel the fingers of that first hand I seized, how they cemented into mine, bone grinding against bone, how they clamped down with such a grip that I saw the sinuous veins of the wrist pounding. The force of that hold. My hand in a stranger's hand, in a bond stronger and more intimate than an umbilical cord, and my whole body shaking with the force of the hold as I pulled upwards and dragged the naked torso from the waves. It was the touch of another's hand and the feel of another's flesh that activated with him, within him the power he describes as love. When the Galata came to shore and the migrants were taken by police and emergency staff to the reception center, he wanted to stay with them. He wanted to take their hands again, to talk to them. He wanted to sit down with them, to ask how they were, who they were, why they'd come. He wanted to know if the fishing boats or the Coast Guard had found their families, if they'd been reunited with their loved ones. He had to know what happened. He would not give up on them. In the days and weeks that followed, Carmine and his friends were overcome by grief. Each suffered in his or her own way, dealing with nightmares, panic attacks, insomnia, anger, and depression. Carmine had never felt such emotional intensity or sorrow. He also knew more pain was still to come because more boats will be coming every day, more hands grasping for help. Reporters came knocking, wanting to get the story. But Carmine wasn't interested in being described as a hero, replaying in his mind over and over again that terrible time, seeing the floating bodies of the dead. A total of 368 people died that day. And later learning that other boats ignored their cries for help, Carmine feels that he failed these people. Indeed, the civilizations of Europe were failing these people. It wasn't lost on him that these migrants came from Eritrea, a former colony of Italy. It's important to stress that the scene of rescue was also a scene of disaster because it signaled decades of colonial Western economic and political policies that decimated local institutions and traditions, displaced landholders, created millions of refugees, and then made them feel unwelcome. The rapid and recent creation of border walls in Europe. Consider that in 1989 there were 15 fortified walls, but by 2016 almost 70, with several more being planned. These walls and the growing violence being directed at migrants indicated a startling failure to recognize and welcome these migrants as human beings, a striking refusal to offer a hand of help in the face of another's need. As Carmine reflected on this day, he says that he finally came to see these migrants as people, 
And these people had a claim on his life. He insists that he is no one's savior. Instead, Carmine discovered how blind and deaf he had been to the cries for help that populated his world, and how willfully ignorant he was about the policies and pressures pushing people to make the heart-wrenching choice to flee their homes. In an important sense, the migrants he rescued also rescued him because they put, in him, put him in touch with life's meaning and pulse and helped him to appreciate that the principles by which he organized his life needed to be rethought. What he now knew is that he had an active, however small role to play in creating a more hospitable world, a world that welcomed strangers and offered help to those who needed it. The migrants were strangers, but he came to feel a bond with them that went beyond friendship. The people he had rescued were on the brink of existence, and when he held their hands in his, when he watched them take their first, first breaths on the Galata's deck, he knew he had touched the very essence of life. They had looked him in the eye, and they had chosen to live. The survivors didn't stay in Lampedusa. They were eventually moved on to destinations further north. Carmine worried for them because he knew that a warm welcome was unlikely wherever they went. A year later, several came back to be with Carmine and his friends and to visit the site of the tragedy. It was a tearful and a joyous reunion. One came running to Rosaria, embraced her in a tight hug, and showed her the t-shirt she had given him when he was first pulled onto the Galata. It was the token of kindness he kept and needed as he journeyed through the degradations of refugee camps and detention centers. Two others presented the group a piece of paper. It was a simple but beautifully executed drawing of a grasping hand coming out of the water and being met above by another hand which clasped it in a fierce grip. Then they embarked on the Galata to visit the tragic site that first brought them together. When they arrived at the scene, the survivors asked that they join hands again. Some prayed, some sang, some threw flowers onto the ocean, some simply sobbed. As they prepared to return to shore, one of the teenagers pointed to the water and said, that is where he died. He then pointed to the deck of the Galata and said, this is where he was reborn. I have told this story because it gives us an entry point into what will surely be one of the most challenging dimensions of our climate change world, namely the creation of millions of refugees. But I have also told it because it enables us to appreciate what I take to be several vital ingredients in a hopeful life. As I understand it, a hopeful life flourishes best when people experience the nurture, care, and protection of others. When they have the freedom to explore and realize the potential that is uniquely theirs. When they know that they are cherished and that they belong. When they feel that this life and this world are precious, even sacred. When they trust that others will come to their aid in times of need. When they live in homes and communities that support their efforts to make a good life when they know they will not be abandoned in times of trouble or wrongdoing, when they feel they can start again when a life path closes or shows itself to be life degrading, and when they commit to and accept responsibility for the flourishing of others. The story of the Eritrean refugees highlights the breakdown of these conditions because they had been forced to flee their homes. They felt abandoned and despised and had become desperate in their efforts to start again and build a new life. But it also shows the power of helping hands that communicated that someone cared about them and had compassion for them. 
The prospect of a hopeful life was ignited and kindled in them by the commitment of Carmen and others to come to their aid and make sure they had a chance to start a new life. I recognize that the current percentage of people worldwide attaining this level of displacement and desperation is relatively small. But relative to what measure? How many is an acceptable number of refugees, especially when we dispense with statistical thinking and keep our focus on the personal losses and tragedies of each unique refugee's life? How should we think about the economic and political policies that create a growing refugee population, or at least see their production as an acceptable byproduct of national and international priorities? These questions are becoming more and more urgent each year because demographers now project that owing to climate change and along with all the social unrest and political conflict this entails, roughly 1.2 billion people worldwide will be displaced by the year 2050. Roughly one of eight people on Earth. This is a staggering number that politicians, economists, and community leaders have barely begun to absorb, let alone assess and address. Preparations to welcome and house, to provide health care and education, job training, these need to begin in earnest. It would be a mistake to think that displacement and desperation are problems only for those officially deemed migrants or refugees. Why? Because People can feel displaced or out of place even while inhabiting what looks like to be a home. Because they're not receiving the care and support they need to feel that they belong and that their lives matter and are worth committing to. They can be among a collection of people and know that no one notices them or would miss them if they were to disappear. These are people who find that no one wants to hold their hand. They can be citizens and sense that government and business leaders do not care about the health of their bodies, the conditions of their neighborhoods, or the health of their food and watersheds. They can become desperate when they feel abandoned and despised or sense that a commendable future is open to others but clearly closed to themselves. They can lose hope when they feel they are trapped in cycles of abuse and systems of injustice. As these examples show, desperation and displacement are not simply descriptors that can be applied to some people. They can also refer to a practical condition or a way of being that determines the feel of life itself and that fosters a disordered and damaging mode of existing in which people feel perpetually adrift, abandoned, unwanted, and alone. When people extend a hand asking for help and then find that hand unseen or ignored, perhaps even slapped away, hope is denied. When people are too afraid or lack the energy to even raise their hands at all, hope dies. This is why so much depends, as Carmine came to understand, on whether or not people can, can learn to turn to each other, come into the presence of others, genuinely face them, and then extend a welcoming hand that is committed to working for their good. The quiet and often unremarked desperation that many ordinary people feel is on a continuum with the desperation that Carmine encountered off the coast of Lampedusa since both are manifestations of the withholding of care and concern. One could even argue that the latter is the mere inevitable logical fulfillment of the former, which is why it is so important that we bring into view and then address the practical conditions and the policies that are producing so many lived contexts in which people feel abandoned, uncared for, or even abused. Put another way, the Eritrean refugees give us a window into the wider and systemic cultural malfunction that is producing the suffering 
that to varying degrees affects millions more. They are human instances of canaries in the coal mine telling us to stop and change what we are doing lest we destroy ourselves and our homes. This is why it matters that we not this is why it matters that we not think of today's global refugee crisis as somehow aberrant or exceptional. According to the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, in the year 2020, roughly 1 in 95 people were displaced. In 2010, it was 1 in 159, reaching this unprecedented level of 82 million people displaced worldwide. These are people that had to flee their homes because of war, persecution, economic injustice and collapse, and a change in climate. Of this number, 48 million were internally displaced, meaning they remained within their country of origin and thus had some hope of returning to their homes one day. But in a climate change world, the hope of return is no more. This is because their home regions will either be too hot or too dangerous. These people live in a stalled, uncertain, and often dangerous state neither able to return home or move to a suitable destination elsewhere. As Matthew Akins has observed, those who are forced abroad usually don't get far. More than four-fifths of the world's refugees are hosted in the developing world, where borders and humanitarian aid from wealthy countries keep them in place. From this dammed-up pool of the displaced, the West takes measured sips. To put this SIP in perspective, in 2020, only 34,000 people out of roughly 34 million needing new homes were resettled to third countries. The rest were confined to camps, detention centers where squalor, disease, hunger, boredom, anger, anxiety often ran rampant. Rampant, sorry. (laughs) They have little choice, since they know that the smuggler's road is extremely dangerous, with smugglers often extorting, raping, and abandoning them. They also know that the borders blocking their escape are heavily guarded and violently enforced. Borders that Patrick Chamusieux describes as being sharpened more and more like the blade of a guillotine. These statistics hardly do justice to the profound existential crisis each displaced person must endure. War and and oppression communicate that human life is cheap, expendable, and unworthy of care. Borders communicate that migrants are unwelcome and to be despised, even hunted down and killed. Scorching heat, Catastrophic droughts and flooding, sea level rise, all climate catastrophes and thus markers of profoundly broken human relationships with Earth and its life-giving systems. These communicate that the wealth and comfort secured for a small minority of people greatly outweighs the misery and desolation that a great majority will have to face. What do the millions of displaced people think and feel when the hope of a life-affirming and life-nurturing home has been destroyed? What should we do about a global economy that encourages the free movement of capital and commodities, but prohibits the free movement of people made poor and desperate by that same economy? Achille Mbembe, echoing France Fanon, says, the global processes that are committed to expropriation and accumulation are creating ever more wretched of the earth. People for whom the right to have rights has been denied. People condemned to live within structures of confinement. People for whom the dream of a decent and praiseworthy life has been taken away. Wars, borders, climate change, economic inequality, Abandoned neighborhoods and communities, these realities are creating a world that is becoming ever more inhospitable to a growing number of people and to countless plant and animal species. They are destroying the homes and communities that nurture all life and thus also destroying the hope people need to live healthy, meaningful, and beautiful lives. Together, they help us see that a culture's top 
and enduring priority must be to cultivate an imagination, to cultivate the sympathy and the practical skills for the creation of hospitable communities and neighborhoods, communities that welcome, nurture, and empower the lives that are unique to each person. It's important to note that from a historical point of view, the extended hand has often been an ambiguous and morally fraught gesture. What may have appeared and even been meant as a hospitable gesture has sometimes turned into a fist that subjugates and violates those it touches or a grip that stifles and restricts their development. Think here of the missionaries that came to save the lost but ended up destroying the indigenous communities they met. Think also of the international financial and development agencies that come with the promise of a better future but end up erasing the traditions and institutions that give people a meaningful and praiseworthy life. As these examples show, good intentions are not enough. A better way is when people approach each other and their shared worlds in gentle postures of humility and solicitude. Postures that do not presume that any of us knows beforehand or definitively what others need. Solicitude requires that people be willing to be with others, listen to them, be instructed by them, and then discover together what needs to be done so that mutual flourishing might be achieved. As I understand it, the name for this way of being is love. Love is the power that, when activated in us, guides our entire being, minds, hearts, and hands, so that hope is not only kindled, but catches fire. Love animates hope because love refuses to abandon others or leave them to die. Recall the young Eritrean man who knew he would die if a hand did not reach out to him and pull him back into life. The deck of the Galata was the site of his, of his rebirth because that is where he felt the love that affirmed his life as worth saving and living. Recall also that Carmine was pulled back into life by the power of love that became activated in him by another hand grasping hold of his. The clasping of two hands and the feel of the power of life circulating through that shared embrace created an awakening within him such that he now realized how precious life is and how worthy it is of his cherishing. I doubt that hope has a future apart from a skilled and practiced cherishing of life. The life that needs cherishing, however, isn't only each and every human life. Our vision and our sympathies must also expand to include the many plant, insect, animal species we share our life with, because human life depends upon and can only make sense in terms of all of them. We cannot truly love our neighbors if we do not also love the neighborhoods, meaning the houses and sidewalks, the gardens and parks, the farm fields and forests, the food sheds and watersheds, that together make our life possible at all. Which is to say that our most fundamental, abiding, and pressing task is to build multiple versions of the Galata, multiple sites all around the world for the restoration, reconciliation, and redemption of living beings. The future of hope, I believe, depends on people awakening to the mysteries, vulnerabilities, and beauties of this world and its life. It depends on people refusing to participate in the programs of displacement and the patterns of violation that leave people abandoned and abused. It depends on people rejecting the economies that make people desperate. And it depends on people joining hands with all the living. This would be a loving embrace of each other and our shared places. And so would be what Wendell Berry describes as a plighted life, a life in which people, 
by pledging themselves to each other's care, become braided to each other. In his poem, In Rain, he says, The way I go is marriage to this place, grace beyond chance, love's braided dance covering the world. Love's braided dance. That is an invitation, I believe, that is worthy of our commitment and the way toward a more hopeful future. Thank you, uh, Professor Wurzberg, for that powerful talk. Um, we have about 10 or 15 minutes for questions, so if people would like to ask any questions about, about hope or about the content of Professor Wurzberg's talk, we have some time. So please, we have some microphones or a microphone running around the chapel, so raise your hand and, if you have a question. Either that or we could sing because we've got the yeah. setup for this. You can do responsive, shape singing. Hey, how are you? Good, thank Good you. Here. Uh, so, I wrote down a question. Uh, hopefully, you can like, translate. But my question is uh, and it's very long to but uh, bear with me. With the minds of everyone feeling, you know, of everyone you know, globally, uh, feeling polarized, uh, people in power only, unknowingly executing the directives of their constituents, um, constituents who believe that the continent always changes, uh, there's no such thing as climate change, uh, and they have like the thought process of kicking the can down the road, and it's not about a uh, understand long term, but I have pressing needs in the short term. I mean fast fixes. Um, and also with the uh, the rise and uh, the more bolder tone of Christian nationalization um, and that whole uh, spirit. I wonder if it is realizing our existential threats and also if it's a far fetched uh, thought that those same people in power are unknowingly or knowingly, uh, perhaps uh, insidiously, you know, leading us into the end times to align with the uh, scriptures of the inevitable devastation of this uh, of this world. Okay, you got a lot of stuff going on there. Those are all really, really good questions, and that, you know, we we can spend a lot of time talking about each of them, but I'll, I'll just speak briefly and, and too bluntly, I think, about some of them. I think, first of all, let's start with your last one about how some people think this is just part of a religious plan to bring the world to an end anyway. Uh, it's, it's really bad theology, and it doesn't rest on any good understanding of Scripture, and I think it's important to talk with people about this. Now, we know that a number of people are simply belligerent. No matter how much you talk to them, they're not going to change their mind because they're not thinking in a sort of rational manner. They're ideologues. And, and there's not much you're going to be able to do to convince them otherwise. Right? So that's one point to make. A second thing to, to say is that for a lot of folks, when they think about climate change, they think about very abstract numbers, perhaps. They think about you know 1.5, 2.5, 3.5 degrees or whatever. And I think what's really helpful to do in those kinds of contexts is to have some standard things to say that are just patently obvious, like melting of glaciers. People in the Himalayan mountain range are really worried about fresh water. Are they gonna be able to drink, irrigate the crops and things like that? But then also to talk about the personal stories of lives who are already being affected by this. Right? COP27 is going on right now, and if it's at all like COP26, which I was at last year in Scotland, there's a marked contrast between the suits at the tables inside the convention halls and the people on the streets marching. And the people on the streets marching, these are the people coming from communities that are dealing and have been dealing with climate change for years, right? These are landed people. They're hunters, fishers, foragers, farmers, 
right, indigenous communities, for them, climate change is not an abstraction that is theoretical down the road. And I think what we need to do is listen to these voices so much more because they're living the realities of climate change. And then point to examples close to home. Right? How is Boston starting to think about sea level rise, which we know they are, because so much of the developed land, the very expensive land in Boston, is at the waterfront. Right? Or where I live in North Carolina, we've got multiple communities living close to the coastline who are saying one more major hurricane, the town is shutting down because we can't sustain yet another flood season. Right? These are the stories that people need to hear so that they don't think about this. And then one last thing, and I wish and Naomi could talk about this for a long time. She's been writing about climate science denial and she's fabulous on this. Another thing is to just pay attention to the words you use. So an example, an ecologist friend of mine got a grant to study climate change by going into farming communities to learn from farmers about what climate change is doing to their systems of agriculture. So she started out going to these farmers and she said to her superior, nobody will talk to me. And the superior said, well, um, are you saying climate change? And she said, yeah, because that's what this study is about. And her supervisor said, say weather. So she went back to the farmers and says, how's, how's the weather been at your farm lately? They couldn't stop talking. Right? So just paying attention to the rhetorical stances we are inhabiting when we speak to people about climate change can be really, really important for affecting a kind of transformation about people's attitudes about these major questions. I don't think I hit everything that you were asking about, but that's some of it, so thank you. Over here. Do you think that there's any functional difference between blind hope about action and just trusting that someone else will fix it and just outright despondency? Is there any difference between the blind hope and despondency? Do you think there's a functional difference? A functional action? difference. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, they're both modes, functionally, of paralysis, right? They're modes of disengagement. They're, they are the refusal of what I talked about as joining with all the living. And we could get into a, you know, a lengthy discussion about what's the moral psychology at play in people, right? Sometimes it's, it's just laziness. I can't deal with it. It's too much. I don't want to know. I want to shield myself. Um, sometimes it's fatigue. I think another thing that you know, I would need to develop if we had more time is there's always a community social context in which people respond to any of life's troubles and possibilities, right? So if you grew up in a community where you were feeling the encouragement of other people to explore, to try, that kind of person is very different than someone who grew up in a community where they felt abandoned. Nobody cared about them. So I don't want to fault people when they feel despondent because they don't feel good about themselves. They can't even care about themselves because nobody's ever cared for them. So how are they supposed to care for the world around them, right? My daughter is a fourth grade school teacher. Some of these kids are growing up in just awful, awful conditions. I can't ask these kids to say, hey, you got to care about climate change. Nobody even cares about whether they've got clean clothes, right? So we have to attend to the sort of the social systems, the communities, the networks of, of people that surround each other because you can't, you can't address the kinds of concern that climate change represent all by yourself, especially when you're starting from a place of such pain and suffering that we know a lot of people are feeling. You know, so along with joining the living, I think we want to talk about creating communities that can help foster hope in each other, because it's really hard by yourself. So yeah, it's a great question. Thanks so much for coming and talking. I mean, uh, I've been reading your book, Food Fit, and really loving it, so I was really uh, I owe you a quarter, I think. I owe you a quarter. Oh, thank you, thank you. Um, yeah, I, um, I just wanted to ask, you know, you spoke really moodily about um, the, the place of love um, in the sort of restorative um, and, and the, the work of hope. Uh, and I guess I'm just curious, like, how do you personally connect with love and in, in, in your life and, and in practice? Yeah. 
Yeah, it's a good question. I think the danger when talking about love is that it can become sentimental or simply romantic. And so, in, in my view, the thing about love is that it's part of a whole suite of characteristics in people such that they want to, first of all, start with the recognition that their attempts to love can often fail. And that makes the venture of love a pretty terrifying thing because I'm the kind of person who wants to think I do right when I intend to do right. And so to be in the presence of somebody who says, you know, you thought you were doing right and you didn't, that can be excruciating. And so one of the things that is important for me to do over and over again is to recognize that I can be deeply mistaken in my efforts to love and that I need to be willing to hear from people who I am with to be able to say, you're messing up. And the way that translates practically is you have to say to people, am I being a jerk? Is my ego getting in the way of the stuff I'm doing when I'm with you? Right? So that's, that's one dimension. That's sort of the, the more harsh side of it. The, a better side of it is the question of time. To love another, to love somebody, to love some place takes time. And this is why, in my view, one of the ways I think about so many of the problems of our modern culture takes us back to the Jewish gift of the Sabbath, which was a teaching that was developed not simply as an afterthought or a luxury that you might do if you've got nothing else going on on that seventh day. It was baked into the very heart of reality because in the schema of reality that the Jews give us, there is this sense that we can quickly miss or even abuse the beauties of this world. And we need to stop and take stock of what is around us so that we can understand how where we are, those we are with, are actually beautiful, blessed, beloved by God. So much so that God decides to stop on the seventh day to take delight in all the goodness and beauty of the world. We can't take delight in the goodness and beauty of the world or truly love it if we don't even know it. And my worry is that the sort of frantic, frenetic pacing of our world and the lives, I mean, my life is, is nuts some of the time. You can't exercise love in a context like that because we're oblivious to where we are and who we're with. And so Sabbath becomes important, again, not just as a personal exercise, but as a communal exercise because we need the help of each other to do this. Sabbath becomes a way, it's an orientation into the world that draws us more attentively into the presence of each other so that we can see what another needs, right? So we can understand how precious they are, what their potential is, so we can come alongside to help that, but also to recognize when they're in suffering or in pain. So again, we can come alongside and help them with that. So that's a rather long-winded way of saying that love requires attention and patience. And to do those kinds of things, you need to slow down. And that's, this is, again, in my own case, where having friends who remind me that I wrote a book about the Sabbath a few years ago, saying, hey, how are you doing with the Sabbath stuff? It's really helpful. It's embarrassing. But it, again, it's very helpful. Because, you know, Flannery O'Connor says this beautifully, how we are so easily, uh, we're so susceptible to deceiving ourselves about ourselves. We are not our own lights, as she says. Think one more. Hi. Hi. So much again for your amazing, this wonderful talk. So, now that we're on the topic of virtues, do you think that in this day and age it might be perhaps helpful for religious communities to once again return to maybe like the value of renouncing? Especially since we consider um, a huge, um, a driving force of this kind of crisis in the Western countries, like here in America, is very much driven by um, economic forces predicated on ideas that um, that people just want things and they're always self-interested and they're always after um, just just things in general. Versus, I think that if we instead um, have a new um, anthropology of the human, where this is not what ultimately we should find our satisfaction in, in material things. Um, so, what, like, and I know that, um, like I said, it's going to be a complicated um, 
discussion because it can also lead to uh, more life denying understandings of, of the cosmos. So I just wonder if like, you could yeah. You're saying the word asceticism? Okay, yeah. yeah. It's a great question, and your, your suggestion of a different kind of anthropology, I think, is spot on. Um, asceticism is a complicated history, right? Because there is a kind of denial that goes on in it that teaches us to despise materiality, embodiment, even the things of this world. And I find that a deeply troubling way of thinking about the world because in my way of thinking about the world, everything that is exists because it's good for it to be, right? That's what it means to say that they're created, right? Some divine intention, some sacred power, however you want to describe it, makes room for another life because it's good for that other life to be. So if you start with that fundamental affirmation, which is embodied, then the idea that you want to abuse any body, deny any body the possibility of its fulfilled life, is already a problem. But then what we have to do is say, well, what, what are we doing in a kind of crass consumeristic world which is not even honoring bodies? Often plays a role in shaming bodies, right? Think about how there are multiple industries devoted to making you think your body is awful. So you've got fashion, you've got diet, you've got surgeons, surgeries, you've got all kinds of ways to sort of tackle your body and sort of bend it into somebody else's ideal of what that body should be. And it's based on a kind of loathing of embodiment as given. So in a way what I'm, I'm asking people to think about when we're asking about what kind of a human are we is take time to ask yourself what really makes you happy. And I think for a lot of people, the answer isn't that hard to come by because they know that they're at their happiest when they feel loved. And so much of what people do is an effort, I think, to compensate for the fact that they don't feel that they're loved, that they don't feel that they matter, that they don't feel that they belong. And so to create community contexts in which people know they belong, they know they will be missed if they're not there. They know that somebody is looking out for them. If we had that, would we need to keep buying all this stuff to distract us? I don't think so. Or if we knew that the things we made were made out of a loving intention that thought it was good to make this device or this piece of furniture or this home. If we knew that the things we use in our world are cherished, would we be so quick to throw them away? If we knew that behind this sweater that I'm wearing, there is the love of somebody who made it? Right? I think our whole world suffers from a deficit of cherishing, of a loving intention that we can't see in each other, in ourselves, and in our world. And we're all suffering, right? Robin Wall Kimmerer in Braiding Sweetgrass, which I'm guessing many of you have read, and maybe everybody's reading, which is fabulous. She says, when Western Europeans came to this land, they didn't have the experience of land loving them because they only came to see it as property to possess, to mine, to exploit. But she says, one of the most important things about a human being's life is that they don't just feel the love of each other, but that they feel that the ground on which they move and from which they draw their sustenance and livelihood loves them. Because can you love yourself if the whole world you live through is characterized as meaningless, as trash, as something to be abused? I don't think so, right? How we treat each other is often a reflection of how we treat our land and our water. And we've got to heal both. right? And that means investing again in each other, investing in the things that we make, investing in the things that we build. Because apart from that loving intention, not just the world, but our lives, I think, become greatly diminished. And in the eyes of a lot of people, really not worth very much. So we, we come back to love. We couldn't end with exactly. diminishment. So we end with, with love, okay? <laughs> All right, thank you so much.